Well, that was refreshing. Welcome back to the Dallas Prospect, everybody. I am DDP, and today we're going to be talking about my five observations from this latest Mavericks win. They go into Chicago. They beat the currently ninth place Bulls. That means they are playing 127 to 92. Now, this was a blowout from the jump. Like, there's no two ways about it. The first thing, first thing I need to, to point out here, the Mavs, during this now three-game win streak, the Mavericks are doing a better job of dictating the style of play. If you watched my uh, appearance Monday, was it Monday? No. Sunday. No. Friday. Days blur together, man. If you saw uh, the roundtable that I had with We Talk Mavs and Slightly Biased on Friday, by the way, salute to those guys. Great work. Had a lot of fun uh, with the episode and enjoyed getting to come on and talk with them. But if you watch that, you, you heard us talking about some of the recent struggles for the Mavericks. And one of the things that we cited was the Mavericks kind of playing to the other team's strength playing less Gafford in the Pacer games because they're trying to play pace with the Pacers, which just does not make sense. It used to be a, almost to a fault that the Mavericks would just stick to their style of play. They wouldn't pick up the pace. They, they know how good they are in the half court. And doggedly so, they refused to push the pace and get out in transition, despite having a guy that can throw touchdown passes like Luka Doncic left and right all day on a dime. And now you've got the athletes to go get it. So that, that used to be to a fault that they would try and stick only to what they do. But trying to play pace with the Pacers, not once but twice in the span of like three or four games, was mind-boggling. And we saw that in other areas too as the Mavericks you know, lost five out of six. Everything seemed like it was wheels falling off. And now we've gotten into a three-game winning streak that began with a quality win against the Heat. Yes, the Heat are like the sixth seed at the time of it happening. But it's still a talented team. And it wasn't a perfect game against the Heat by any means, but they did enough of what they had to. And I talked about that being, I thought, a watershed moment for them, a chance to kind of right the ship, get back on track, because they were reeling after that. The Pacers game ended the seven-game win streak. Then they had the debacle um, with Cleveland around that time where you, you have just the most improbable loss that you could possibly suffer in that game in the closing minutes and so i think it knocked them back on their heels and then they just kept taking left hook jab jab like they could not get their feet set and get back on track and that heat game i felt like was huge for them taking those punches withstanding that barrage and then closing it out making the plays they had to to win we'll see but right now they're on a three-game winning streak and they are playing back to their style of ball. And it is making a difference. That's the first thing I want to call to. Next, the Mavericks played a near perfect first quarter in this game. Like, this, was, this game was not a game. It was over in the opening minutes. The Mavericks score 44 points in the opening frame. While somehow only giving up 16. Yeah, you heard me right. 16. This team, with its abysmal defense post-All-Star break, Gave up only 16 points in the first quarter. Now, I don't know what the Bulls are in terms of talent. Uh, again, they're three games under 500 now, but they are still sitting at ninth in the East. Yeah, that was, that was um, impressive in the worst kind of way for them. But Dallas being up 44 to 16 after one frame, you're like, we're done. Like, it, it would take such a monumental just reversal of fortune and collapse for this to even be competitive again. But you can't rule it out because recent history. The Mavericks didn't give up on that. The Bulls, yes, they open up on like a 7-0 run in the second quarter. It doesn't matter. The Mavericks are just toying with them at that point. They're up like 20-plus at half. And they never really got threatened. And the reason for that is, for once, it was the other team not adjusting to what you were doing. Because the Mavericks, point three, absolutely bludgeoned them. With their center rotation, Lively and Gafford, unstoppable. Gafford has now set an NBA record for consecutive makes without a miss, which is what a consecutive make would be, 
uh, at, I want to say 27. I actually don't have that number right in front of me, but he goes nine for nine on the game. His last five games, the dude just doesn't miss. The Mavericks are 4-0 and now with him in the starting lineup. And I love Lively. I think them being balanced minutes-wise, like straight up, being a 50-50 trade-off, is perfect. It's like the best two-man center uh, rotation you could have. It's a perfect two-headed monster for that position. And it changes this team. It changes their, their prospects in the best kind of way. Gafford goes 9-for-9, nine nine, though. I think at 4-for-4, four four, he set the mark, and it was 23 at the time. So basic math says add 5 to that. So, okay, maybe it's 28. Uh, consecutive at this point for Gafford. Correct me in the comments if I'm wrong on that. Um, but just absolutely dominant. And it wasn't even just Gafford. Like, yeah, he's nine for nine. That's, su su you know, that's stupendous. I almost said subpar. I was trying to say stupendous and I got just tripped up. Phenomenal uh, in that case. But you also have Lively going 11 of 12 from the field. So between the two of them, they were 20 of 21 from the field. That's 95.2%. Good googly moogly. The Mavericks, both of them go for 20. Uh, you get, what, 20 points out of Gafford and 22, I believe, out of Lively. Yep. Just incredible stuff there. It marked the first time in Mavs history that Dallas had two players score 20 plus points combined on 95 plus percent from the field in the same game. That's from Mavs PR. So just un unbelievable what they were able to get there. The Bulls had no answers for it. And it wasn't just destroying them in the pick and roll. It was getting out in transition. Lively just looking like a stallion out there streaking down the floor. Dallas hitting them with perfect pinpoint passes down the court. And he's just throwing it down on guys. Gafford's dunking on fools. He's showing touch around the rim. All the all the kind of stuff. Like, yeah, he doesn't have a post-up game. But his touch around the rim has been sensational lately. And again, Dallas is 4-0 with him in the starting lineup. I love me lively. I think that is the future everyday starter. But having Gafford, there's something about it. The energy he's got and the presence. Splitting their minutes 50-50, but letting Gafford kind of be the starting point right now feels like the right thing. I'm, I'm a believer in the eyeball test. You can get kind of caught up in the muddy waters of the, the analytics if you really go too deep into it. The eyeball test right now tells me that Gafford, as your current starter, makes the most sense. So that's where I'm in favor. Also in this game, as we talk about that near-perfect first quarter, I want to move into the point about Tim Hardaway Jr. Now, he does play 18 minutes. Hey, that's great. That is... That that looks like standard lifting for him, right? Except, I don't think he played in the first quarter. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think he played in the first quarter. And again, that first quarter was 44-16 Dallas. Hardaway's shot selection has remained very perplexing, to put it mildly, throughout this struggle. I understand Shooter's going to shoot. He's going to try and work his way out of a funk. But the thing is, Hardaway's heat check mentality happens whether he's one of 10 or 10 for 10. It does not matter. And even more, it feels like he's pressing more and more trying to force that issue. Now, he did finally have a breakthrough game. I don't want to completely disparage him. He did finally have a breakthrough game this past game. He had 17 points in 18 minutes against Detroit on 6 of 13 from the field, 4 of 8 from 3. Weirdly, only 1 of 4 at the line, but he was a plus 13. Now, Detroit played you physical. You still beat them by um, 18 points. But the interesting thing in that to me was like, okay, Hardaway seems like he's had his little bit of a breakthrough moment. You even saw Luca kind of vibing with him in that breakthrough um, on the bench at one point as Hardaway is knocking down threes. And it's like, okay, cool, cool. End of the third quarter, Hardaway's hitting a big three. Maybe this is fun finally going to turn the corner and we'll get a streak of hot Hardaway shooting. I was a little worried about that as my voice cracks, maybe appropriately there. I was a little worried because I thought like, you know, when you have that moment of breakthrough, sometimes you think like, oh, it's over now. I'm, I'm good. In fact, now I'm going on a hot streak. I can just turn it loose. And sometimes that one game is just one game. And you get a performance where a guy comes out the next game and he's just more than ever, just like, all right, here we go. Let's go, 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 go. And just taking shot after shot after shot. So the Mavericks almost 
and this is complete conjecture on my part, but almost preemptively like reeling him in, like, all right, let's not worry about this for the first quarter, really. And he gets most of those minutes then in the second half, again, garbage time, because this game is over immediately. Really, I thought, said a lot. And even in that, Hardaway in 18 minutes, four points, four assists, one of four from the field, 0 of three from three. So, yeah, um, garbage time or not, it might have just been a one-game thing with Detroit. might not have been a breakthrough moment for him. Not that there were stakes involved with this, but I would say, if anything, that should just take the pressure off. So, worth noting, Hardaway for the defensive deficiencies and for his shot selection, which has grown increasingly aggressive and erratic, to be reeled in on that, uh, I think could be big for this team if they're actually finally recognizing and understanding, like, not saying you can't play him, but we need to be much more selective in how we utilize him right now because he has been, for an extended period now, a net negative. And I remember at the trade deadline, some people were like really upset with me. Like I was gunning at Hardaway. Like I was being unfair to Hardaway. And for the most part, he's had a good year. But I don't, I don't agree that saying a player has struggled and that we've seen what a player is over the course of what, like five years now? Saying that like, yeah, maybe this isn't it. Maybe this isn't somebody that we should long-term invest in. Maybe we would have been better off moving him at the deadline. That's not the same thing as like hating a dude. I don't personally hate Hardaway. I don't want anything bad for Hardaway. I just don't think he helps this team right now like they need help. When he's on, especially if he's able to be on in like a postseason run, he's phenomenal. When you got him as your third guy and he's actually hitting shots, fantastic. The Mavericks are nigh unbeatable when you got your first two guys rocking and then Hardaway is also splashing threes. The problem is it's feast and famine and too often it's – the famine is just killing you, whereas the feast might make your belly full for the night, but you're going to be hungry the next day. I feel like I said something very smart there, but now that I think about it, not so much. So I'm just going to move on from that point. So something to keep an eye on with Hardaway. Lastly here, Lucas streak of seven straight games with 35 plus point triple doubles does come to an end. He ends with 27, 12, and 14. He was gunning for it late. He wanted it. But this was such a one-sided blowout. Uh, yeah, he was upset coming out of the game. He wanted to keep this streak going. But it already was the longest such streak in NBA history and the third longest triple-double streak um, in NBA history behind, I think, Oscar Robertson had 11 at one point and Russell Westbrook had nine. Maybe I'm flipping those. But uh, those were the numbers I saw, and those are the two guys that had longer streaks of consecutive triple-doubles. Um, but Luca was the only one rocking that with 35 plus points per game. And it's really, it, it's, it's stupendous in all these, all these great uh, ways that it's, it's hard to almost contextualize how good it is. Like when you look at how he's been averaging like post all-star break, even as the Mavericks have struggled, averaging almost 40 point, you know, 40 point averages uh, with a triple double on like 50, 40, 90, practically shooting splits. It's obscene. But because the Mavericks struggled, not only is he not getting the credit, he's getting a lot of the blame and a lot of the hate. And I see at times where he's pushing and he's doing too much and it feels like keeping his own, not narrative, but his own um, his own greatness kind of front and foremost. And I kind of felt a little bit that way with him wanting to, to stay in the game longer, even though the game was well decided. So he could try to keep that 35 point triple double streak going, but he had, he had opportunities in it and it ultimately doesn't matter or benefit the team at this point. You don't want to keep your guy out there for a chance of getting banged up or worse, just so he can chase an arbitrary record that he already owns at this point. Again, if you're going off 35 point triple doubles, he already owns the record at this point. So don't, don't worry about it. Just move on. You don't need to extend the record further in garbage time just to say that you kept it alive that's how you have like people discounting russell westbrook's triple double um mvp season the, the triple double record breaking season where he won his mvp because they're like oh well you had centers boxing out just to allow him to get the rebounds he was ending up with like 15 rebounds like a game in a lot of those games like it wasn't i i don't know that's a whole different thing um I don't understand discounting the the greatness of an individual player 
just by saying like, well, the team put him in position to, to do something historic and record breaking. Yeah. Yeah. And it still powered them to the postseason. And whether it was him getting those boards or Steven Adams or whoever wasn't going to make a huge difference in the, in the future of the team. So long as somebody was getting those rebounds, somebody was doing that. Anyway, for Luca, I'm not worried about it. Uh, I think it's actually probably a good thing that the streak ends and we move forward with this, trying to build on this now three game win streak here. The last thing I wanted to add to earlier. Um, well, first of all, here's this stat about Luca. Luca Doncic at the rim. This is from Stat Mamba. Luka Doncic at the rim this season is shooting 83.8%, which of course leads the NBA. That's one of those stats that like, you know, he's been automatic even in that position. But when you consider the attention he garners, the, the way teams game plan and just blitz him with everything, the physicality he has to play through, like even in games um, where the Mavericks have struggled recently, the physicality he's had to deal with being just constantly fouled and checked and hacked at. Yeah. It, it's unbelievable when you think about it in those terms that like, despite all of that, he's shooting like 84% at the rim this year with the usage, with the number of drives he makes and the, the physicality, the attention and all of that, that he faces. It's incredible. Uh, it really is. And I, and I'm running out of superlatives, superlatives. Oh no, I tried to use a smart word and I immediately messed it up. I'm running out of fancy words, colorful words to explain just how impressive uh, this has been lately. But for the Mavericks, this is a much, much needed win. Um, in that it's now building on this, you got to handle your business against these lesser teams. They've now got the Warriors coming in. It sounds like Steph is not likely to play. That's huge. Stand on your business, take care of it, and keep moving you're still sitting at eighth you're i think one back in the loss column of the seven seed you're what like a game back i think of phoenix uh at the six so six is still within reach five is not out of the question but you got to build on some momentum here this is where again if your schedule is on the lesser side in terms of strength of schedule down the stretch good take advantage of it do that right now build on it to put you in a more favorable position I want to hit the total stats as well on that Lively Gafford thing. I mentioned earlier their points and the field goals and all of that. Lively was 22 points, which is a career high. Uh, seven rebounds, two blocks on 11 of 12 from the field. Gafford was 20 points, seven blocks. Sorry, <laughs> seven rebounds, two blocks on nine of nine from the field. I think it's the best center duo in the league. And in games where the Mavericks play to their strengths and don't overthink it, where they actually utilize Gafford um, better on the minutes front, I think that they are just difficult for anybody to handle. I think they can go toe to toe with most anybody, especially with the kind of run Luca's on. Kyrie has been such a steady hand for them as well. He's been just great um, for them. Has contributed a lot. Now a little ho home for Kyrie tonight, 14, three and one, but I'm not worried about it. Again, this was a game that you did not need Kyrie to, to be phenomenal. Like you were bludgeoning them so much with your center duo and then Luca doing just enough of what sensational stuff Luca does that you didn't need a big performance from Kyrie tonight. And I'd rather, I'd rather conserve the great Kyrie moments and bursts of energy for where they're necessary. So love a lot of what this team's got going on here. I'm hoping that this roller coaster, as we talk about the peaks and valleys, the mountaintops and valleys of this team, I'm hoping that they're steadying the ship a little bit here and we're just going to start a steady climb because we went from a seven game high to a about six game, just drudge where everything felt awful. And now we're kind of moving back up into the, up that mountain again. And it's like, okay, cool. Let's hope there's not another Valley on the other side. Let's hope it's at least a steady kind of build here. And we keep moving up because I think this team does have potential. And I do think that when they get out of their own way, they, they can do something. But let me know in the comments, what did you think? Is this a game that you put any stock in at all, even if it's just handling your own business when you should? Or is there more you got to see from this team? Let me know in the comments, like the video, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace!